Good morning, once again. I always enjoy Sunday mornings like this, when it's like this outside. It seems like a strange thing. Because when you're in here, when we're all together, and we're focused on better things than the rain and the cold, um, you forget about all that. So, of all places we could be on a day such as this, I can't think of a, a better scenario. So, I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad you're all here. Our lesson this morning is titled, All the Runners. And we base that title off of a passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We're going to read that together here in just a moment. There at the end of that ninth chapter. And it's actually a passage that probably is familiar to most all of us. But I was thinking about some concepts that related to that passage over this past week and um, decided I would uh, put a lesson together based upon that. So let's read that together. 1 Corinthians 9, starting in verse 24. Uh, the Apostle Paul, writing here through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says, or rather asks the question, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but there's one that receives the prize? So he says, Run in such a way that you may obtain it. Everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I preach to others, I myself should become disqualified. One of the things that is highlighted here in regards to being a Christian, being a follower of Christ, is that Paul likens it to starting a race. Now, as he's talking about the concept of people running in a race, he starts off the thought, as we think about a typical uh, competition of that sort, you got all these people that are running, but at the end, there's just one winner. Now, that is not to say that as we think about this concept in relation to being Christians and striving towards heaven that we're all running but only one of us is going to get there that's that's not what he's saying but what he is saying is that we should have the mindset of the person that's going to win the race that we're going to put in the work we're going to discipline ourselves we are going to train every day as hard as we can take it as seriously as we can so that at the end when everything is settled we receive that crown that we were running for. A lot of interesting things to think about in the words that we've looked at here. And in fact, the first point of our lesson uh, is kind of where my thoughts started as I was putting this all together. I thought maybe the lesson in and of itself would be titled, Everybody Gets a Trophy. Uh, but the more I thought about things, it ended up just being one of the points of the lesson. But it's interesting because, you know, looking at what Paul explains or expresses about um, earthly competitions, athletic competitions, such as a race or a, a boxing match, he also uses that analogy there. Historically, those kinds of events... Just as he describes, there is just one winner, right? But over the course of time, especially in modern times, it seems that people have become more, uh, I don't know, what's the word for it? 
uh, sensitive or they're afraid of hurting anybody else's feelings. And so you've probably seen this phenomenon of, well, everybody gets a trophy whether you want or not. It's kind of this idea, well, if you had fun doing it, well, then you still won. You're still, still a winner. <laughs> I have to laugh. I'm sorry. Um, obviously, training somebody with this kind of mentality from a young age can lead to disappointment when they get out in the quote-unquote real world and they realize that, no, <laughs> that's not how the world really works, right? Not everybody gets a trophy just because they participated in something. Uh, you really do have to put in hard work and, and train to be the best you can be to succeed. Um, an example that I was thinking about in relation to this is actually one of the hymns that we sing. And as I did some research on this, I was actually kind of surprised. Uh, the hymn in its original format, we probably all know this song, When We All Get to Heaven, that's, that's how it is in the uh, hymns for worship book that we've been mostly using here as of late uh, written by Eliza Hewitt uh, the original lyrics are just that when we all get to heaven now I grew up singing that song a little bit differently maybe some of you did also and you'll notice that in the sacred selections hymn book the lyrics actually read when the saved get to heaven so as I grew up, that's how I always sang that song. And then all of a sudden I moved to a different congregation and they were using a different book. It actually used what I came to find was the original lyrics, uh, when we all get to heaven. And all I could think about as I sang that different version was, well, here we go. Everybody gets a trophy, right? <laughs> we're just playing into this silly mindset. But I actually like the modified lyrics better uh, and it's not to say that when you know especially you think about well who would normally be singing this song well it's intended for Christians right who are gathered together to praise and worship and ideally yes uh, everyone who is a Christian that should be the result if if the person is faithful right and so we should be able to I'm not saying that we shouldn't sing the original format of the song or the original lyrics uh, but when we study the Bible, we understand that there's a lot of work involved, right, in being a faithful Christian so as to ultimately receive the prize that we're all striving for. We know that God wants everyone to be saved. That point is expressed i mean if you just want to summarize the bible and summarize well what is the word of god ultimately revealing to us well it's god's love it's god's mercy towards we who have failed him we who have sinned against him second peter chapter three a lot of these verses we we know by heart i'm sure where there you recall peter was discussing the promise of the end of time and how some were mocking that promise and they were saying well you know all things have continued just as they always have where's this promise of jesus returning and things ending and peter explains there in that ninth verse that god is not slack concerning his promise his promise of final judgment for all mankind but he's long-suffering towards us not willing that any should perish, but that all would come to repentance. And so there again, even in that verse which uh, talks about the great love and mercy of God and his patience in hopes that we would all be saved, you notice there that it's that all would come to repentance. There's something expected of us, right? We have to turn away from the things that separate us from God and embrace those things which draw us closer to him, having been cleansed by the blood of his son. And Romans 8 and verse 1 highlights the importance of that. You know, we can't even begin running the race. We can't even begin striving towards the crown if we haven't first put on Christ as that initial first step of obedience, which cleanses us and translates us out of darkness and into the light of Christ. Paul said there in Romans 8.1 that there's no 
condemnation for those that are in Christ. And of course, Galatians 3.27 explains that process of the translation of going outside of Christ into Christ is through putting him on in baptism, Galatians 3 and verse 27. You recall what the Hebrew writer mentioned there in chapter 5 and verse 9 about Christ as the author of eternal salvation? It says there that he's the author of eternal salvation unto all that obey him. God wants everybody to be saved, and he's made it possible for everybody to be saved, but it's only going to be realized by those that are willing to obey him. James talks about the need for obedience in James chapter 1 there. You read with me, starting in verse 21. He says, Lay aside all filthiness, all overflow of wickedness. Receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not just hearers only, deceiving yourselves. If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, He's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. He observes himself, goes his way, and then immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks that he's religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, to keep oneself unspotted from the world. It's about action. It's about doing the will of God, not just believing it, not just even understanding it. It's about applying it. And of course, back in Matthew chapter 7 there, you recall, Jesus talking about the end of time and how there's going to be those that are speaking to him about all the good things that they did, uh, did all these wonders and, and mighty deeds in the name of Christ. But Jesus says that it's not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, uh, is going to enter that kingdom of heaven, but it's the one who does the will of my Father. There's going to be a lot of people who are convinced that they were living the right life, that they ran the way they ought to have ran. But as Jesus expresses there in verse 23 of that text, uh, he's going to declare to them, I never knew who you were. And he's going to tell them to depart because they've been practicing lawlessness. So this, this concept of everybody gets a trophy, obviously in some senses we can think about that and find some humor in that and laugh about it a little bit, but when it boils down to spiritual things, it's really a very serious subject. We have to understand that we have to be so very serious, as Paul again expresses in that text that we kind of noticed there at the beginning, uh, we, we have to be disciplined, we have to be very serious about doing the will of God as he's expressed it. And that kind of leads us into our next point here. These are, you know, on your outline you have the blanks. These probably are two words you weren't expecting to fill in, but that's nonetheless what I want you to fill in there. Bruised and enslaved. And I'll explain why we chose those words here for our, our second point. Again, referring back to 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 27, where... He says, I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, uh, lest even after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. When you look at the original Greek words that Paul uses there, it's, it's kind of interesting. And I'm probably going to butcher the pronunciation of these. They're not the easiest of the Greek words to try and pronounce. Uh, but the word that is translated or rendered as discipline, that phrase of disciplining himself, uh, comes from the Greek word hupopiazo, which literally means to strike in the face, to hit under the eye, 
to buffet or disable an antagonist as a pugilist. So you remember the, the previous verse there, he talked about, he made the statement, I fight as one that does not beat the air. So he'd been talking about the concept of a, of a race and running a race, but then he also uses that analogy of a fighter, a boxer, who, if undisciplined, untrained, uh, is going to go out there swinging his arms and not hitting anything. So in contrast to that statement of, I fight as one not beating the air, he says, I discipline my body. The word here is to strike with purpose and meaning and seriousness so as to disable the antagonist, right, in a, in a match. And the interesting thing about it, though, is that when we think about this in relation to ourselves as Christians, who are we fighting? Now, we might say, ultimately, it, it boils down to we're fighting against Satan, right? We understand that. But really, we, we should think about it as fighting ourselves. And we have to be pretty brutal with ourselves if we really want to be successful in doing the will of God. We have to be willing to punch ourselves in the face and bruise up the eyes and say, you're not going to do that. You know, this is against the will of God. We're not going to entertain these thoughts anymore. We're not going to go this direction anymore. We're not going to hang out with these people over here anymore because these things lead us where God doesn't want us. The other word that's used there in that sentence, which is rendered to bring into subjection or to enslave, is dolago geo, uh, which has the idea of being a slave driver behind it in the definition, which we think about that concept and we think about history and some of the things that have gone on, and it's pretty negative connotations related to that, that concept, obviously. But again, as we think about in relation to ourselves and how we have to discipline ourselves, um, not only do we have to be harsh and very... Um, blunt with our thoughts and our actions and whether or not those match up to what God wants, but we have to be diligent about doing that, don't we? You know, a slave driver, you picture somebody uh, with a whip and they're just relentlessly beating on that slave, uh, prompting them to do what they're being instructed to do. And we have to be that way towards ourselves. You know, you think about um, the concepts of, you know, exercising, dieting. A lot of times with a diet, you have your, your cheat days, right? Oh, well, I've been so disciplined for, you know, the past six days, and now it's the seventh day, and I'm going to have my cheat day, right? I don't have to follow the diet today. But when it comes to spiritual things, we, we can't let cheat days slip in there, can we? That's not what Paul's teaching us here. He's not saying, well, be real serious. Once in a while you can, you know, go out here and have some fun. You know, that's fine. No, he's not, he's not saying that. We have to be very diligent every single day. Denying our flesh the desires that it has. Uh, denying our eyes from looking at this thing or that thing, etc., resisting the urge to prop ourselves up and give in to the pride of life, right? Let's notice a few, a few verses on, on this point. Let's come back, uh, first of all, to Proverbs. Look there with me in Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 30, and notice what the proverb writer says there. He says, blows that hurt cleanse away evil. As do stripes, the inner depths of the heart. And we think about that maybe in relation to um, being children and growing up and being disciplined by our parents, right? When you receive that discipline, that pain, uh, it makes you not want to go and do that anymore, right? I don't want to have to go through this punishment again, so I'm going to change my behavior. And that's basically what he's saying here. But we can make application to, to self as well. Romans 12 and verse 1 is all about the idea of disciplining self. 
Consider yourselves to be living sacrifices, you recall, Paul says there. Giving up our desires, giving up what we want so that Christ can be glorified rather than ourselves. Let's come over here to Matthew chapter 16. And you notice how Christ behaved even towards uh, his own disciple. How harsh he was so as to avoid giving in to temptation. Matthew chapter 16 and um, really verses 23 and 24, but, but we should jump back just a little bit there so that uh, we can understand the context of how these things unfold. So look at verse 21. It says, From that time Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed to be raised again the third day. You notice Peter takes him aside there in verse 22 and begins to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Now Peter had that same problem all the way up. You remember when Jesus was arrested. Uh, Brother Matt read that passage for us as we were preparing our minds for the Lord's Supper. And Peter even then was drawing his sword. Nope, this isn't happening. I'm not letting this happen. Resisting ultimately what God's will was in the matter and why Jesus came to begin with, you see. And notice how Jesus responds to that. Now, again, keep in mind that where's Peter's heart in all of this? Is he trying to do something bad? Does he have bad intentions behind what he's saying to Jesus? No. Nothing but good, right? He, he doesn't want anything bad to happen to Christ, and he's determined in his zeal to not let anything bad happen to him. He wants to defend his Lord. But again, he's not understanding the mission. He's not understanding why Jesus came and, and why these things he's explaining have to happen. So Jesus turns and says to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me. You are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. And he goes on from there to begin teaching them about what it means to follow him which uh, really plays into his response just a moment ago to Peter. If anyone desires to come after me, he has to deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Sometimes maybe we have to say, maybe we aren't as harsh when we say it, but we maybe have to say something similar to a friend. Right? Well, just come with me and do this thing. It'll be fun. Why do you always have to be such a fuddy-duddy and not want to go do anything exciting? We'll just do it this one time. Now, how do we respond? Do we, okay, fine, I'll go just one time, though, and then that's it? Or do we have the attitude of Jesus and that discipline and that self-denial, recognizing that this is Satan trying to tempt us, trying to pull us off the path. Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. A lot of times we have to yell at ourselves, though. Again, coming back to that point. You could be driving down the road in your car all by yourself. And thoughts will creep in your mind. And you have to yell at yourself. Get behind me, Satan. We're not going to entertain these thoughts. We're not going to have these things going through our brains. Because that's how it leads to action. That's how it leads to sin. Of course, in Luke chapter 4 and verse 8, uh, another occasion where Jesus, uh, directly speaking to Satan on that, uh, at that time when he was tempted there in the wilderness and Satan was like, hey, look, just bow down to me and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world, all the riches you could ever want. And he said, get behind me, Satan. We need to learn from Jesus in this respect and, and make application. Let's come back here to the Psalms. Uh, look at Psalm 101. A couple verses here that I think, again, correlate well with the thought that we're bringing out. 101st Psalm there and looking at verses 3 and 4. Notice the determination of David here. 
He says, I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. He says, I hate the work of those who fall away, and it shall not cling to me. A perverse heart shall depart from me, and I will not know wickedness. The thought here reminded me of what Paul said in Romans 12 and 9, where he talks about love being without hypocrisy. He says, abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. To abhor something is, is to completely and utterly detest it. And so if God says something is evil, then our attitude towards that thing should be repulsion. As though somebody were trying to serve us a chicken pot pie made out of vomit. Let's go back to that analogy. I just got the eye roll from Carla. <laughs> it's, it's disgusting, right? We don't want any part of that. That's gross. We're not going to eat that. But sadly, when it comes to sin sometimes, we ignore certain things, right? We, we deceive ourselves into thinking, well, somehow it's still going to be good. Somehow it's going to be what I want. It's going to get me satisfaction somehow. It's, it's, we have to be more serious. And obviously, as, as I was thinking about the thoughts of this lesson, putting all this together, I kept uh, thinking about Forrest Gump. You've probably seen that movie. If you haven't seen it, you've probably seen clips of it or seen quotes from it or something of that nature. But, you know, there, there's a portion of the movie where uh, he, he just, for whatever reason, as he describes it there, he says, I just started running. <laughs> he just kept going. He said, I got to the end of the road and said, well, might as well keep going. And he ran to the end of the town and said, well, I don't know why I'd stop here. And so he kept running and ran to the end of the next town and turns into this whole humorous thing where for years he's just going back and forth across the country and he gets this following of people that are running with him, right? And it's funny. And then just out of, out of the blue, they're out in the middle of the desert somewhere on a highway and there's all these people following him. And he just stops, and it gets real quiet. And you hear somebody in the crowd say, quiet, quiet, he's going to say something. And all of a sudden, he kind of turns around, and he's like, I'm pretty tired. I think I'll go home now. We can't do that as Christians, can we? Again, it kind of goes back to the, the concept of we're going to be blunt. We're going to be willing to hit ourselves in the eye and knock some sense into ourselves if we need to. We use the word of God to do that, obviously. But also, we're that slave driver. We're diligent. Because sometimes you do get tired, don't you? Sometimes you just want to have a day where you just, can I just stop running today and just sit down? But we can't. Because as soon as you do, that's when the lion pounces. Remember what Paul said there in Galatians. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9. He says there, Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. And I also always think about, on that point, I think about what Isaiah expressed back in Isaiah chapter 40. Right at the end of that chapter, verse 31. It says there that those who wait on the Lord, the concept of not just trusting God, not just being patient with God, but I like to think of it like we talked about in a lesson not long ago, uh, waiting in the sense of, of patient service. Those who patiently serve the Lord, notice, shall renew their strength. I don't know if you've ever, maybe you've actually been physically running or you've been engaged in some kind of exercise and you get that second wind. You ever had that experience? Where you're real tired and you're like, oh, I don't know if I can keep going. And all of a sudden you just kind of, all right, I can do this. I can do this. And you kind of get another burst of energy and, and you push through to the end of the exercise or whatever it is. That's how it is for us spiritually. We get tired. We get worn down. 
But if we trust in God and we, we lean upon his strength, it says that our strength is going to be renewed. We're going to mount up with wings like eagles. We'll run and not be weary. See that? We'll walk and not faint. Trust in God and he will supply your every need. But we have to be serious and disciplined in the process. Our final point this morning is stay on the path. Stay on the path. You ever been driving down the road and all of a sudden you come upon, I like to call them a flock of runners, <laughs> and they're just taking up the whole road, right? And you're thinking, why don't you come over here on the, there's a sidewalk right there, right? Or there's a running path right there. You could be over there on the path. But here you are out in the road and you're clogging up traffic and getting in my way, right? Making us late. I was thinking about that concept in connection with James 2 and verse 19. Remember what that says? James is talking about the importance of faith and works together. And he makes a statement there in verse 19 about well, you believe that there's one God, you do well. But he says even the demons believe and tremble. There's a lot of people that are out here in the world and they would profess a quote-unquote faith in God or a faith in Christ. In their mind, they are running the race, but their actions paint a different picture. You know, they're not really following the doctrine of Christ. They're following the teachings of men. They're following their own opinions, whatever it is. And I thought that's a pretty good correlation there. Where you've got people, well, they're running. Well, that's good, but you're not on the path. You're not where you're supposed to be running. You're just out here in the way. <laughs> and in fact, a lot of times... When people behave that way, even ourselves, when we get off the path, we can give runners a bad name. And we don't want to do that. We want to stay on the path. We want to set the pattern for the rest of the world. Now let's come back here to uh, the book of Titus for a moment. Notice some verses here. Titus chapter 2, look with me there, verses 6 to 8. Now in this section of scripture, uh, Paul addresses a number of groups of people, we would say, where he talks about older men, he talks about older women, younger women, younger men. And in verses 6 through 8, he's uh, addressing his words to young men, but I think that Really, when you read, most everything he says there could be applied to just everybody, even though we have different uh, roles and, and things at different times, and, and some of the things might be more specific to that. But nonetheless, notice what he says here. He says, exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all things, notice he says, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine showing integrity and reverence and incorruptibility, and sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say of you. Show yourself a pattern of good works. I've used this analogy before in other lessons when we looked at this passage. I think about growing up as a kid, and my mom would always go to the sewing store, and she would buy patterns uh, most of the Halloween costumes I wore as a kid, my mom sewed them together and made them. But she'd go and buy a pattern so she'd know how to cut the fabric and what size to make it and where to sew it so that it would turn out the way she wanted it to. We have to be the pattern for the world. It's like the song we sing, the world's Bible. God has no hands but our hands. He has no feet but our feet, no mouths 
but our mouths. And a lot of times we're the only Bible that the careless world, as the song words it, will read. What if the type is crooked? What if the print is blurred? Well, obviously we get off the path sometimes, don't we? Well, what then? Do we just give up? Say, well, I got off the path. I guess, guess we're done. I guess we'll go home. Well, no, we need to get back on the path. We need to make correction. Let's come back here to uh, the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. <clears throat> I'm going to start in verse, uh, verse 12. In the preceding verses here, he's discussing how God as a father uh, chastens us, corrects us, and how at times, just like physical correction, can have pain involved, uh, but afterward yields um, positive fruit or positive direction, positive change. Uh, so it is spiritually with us. And so, as he's talked about that concept there, in verse 12, picking up, he says, Therefore strengthen the hands which hang down. Think about being tired. It's kind of the picture there, the hands that hang down. You're tired of punching. You're, you're tired of doing activity. You're, you're just, the hands are hanging down. Strengthen the feeble knees. Your legs are tired. You want to sit. You want to rest. But he says, strengthen your hands and your knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated so that you're not just defeated, but rather that you're healed. He says, pursue peace with all people. Pursue holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Look carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. And by this, many become defiled. Lest there be a fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected. And he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. And so we have to be willing to be harsh and blunt with ourselves, which is painful. And of course, we do that by looking into the mirror of God's word. It's really... God, ultimately, that's being blunt with us because we're allowing his instruction to offer correction. It's hard. It's difficult. It's painful even at times, but it's necessary. Back here in Proverbs once again, looking at chapter 3. Notice there, verse 5, beginning. He says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding, but in all of your ways acknowledge Him. And notice, He shall direct your paths. He'll show you which direction to go. He'll show you where to stay, where the boundaries are that you need to be running. Don't be wise in your own eyes, but fear the Lord, depart from evil, it will be health to your flesh, and it will be strength to your bones. I'd like to conclude our lesson today by looking at a passage that you probably were expecting to see at some point. Again, coming back to Hebrews 12, but looking at the first part of the chapter. And again, thinking of the context of these words, we recognize... Hebrews chapter 11 is that well-known chapter of the power of faith and the heroes of faith. Sometimes we talk about it that way, where by faith Abraham and by faith Noah and by faith all these different ones did the will of God and were blessed as a result. And so keep that in mind as you begin to read here into chapter 12, because this is just one flowing message that the Hebrew writer is writing through the Spirit here. So therefore, we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, who's he talking about? 
Abraham, Noah, Abel, all those that he just talked about in the preceding chapter, all those hundreds, thousands of faithful he says, we're surrounded. It's almost like you picture you're, you're in a, a stadium, right? And you're running the race. You're on the track, and you're running around the track. You're trying to be the, the winner there. And who do you have in the stands? You have all these champions of faith who have run the race and had the success, and they're there cheering you on. You can do it. You can be successful. Just keep going. Just keep your faith and trust in God. He'll give you the strength. We're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, and so let's lay aside every weight. If you're running and you're trying to be as fast as you can, you don't want anything that's going to hold you back, do you? That's exactly what sin does. Holds you back. Pulls you off the path. And the sin which so easily ensnares us, what could that be? Perhaps a lack of faith? As the previous discussion has been all about the importance of faith, if you don't have faith, well then, you don't have anything. And so let's run with endurance the race that is set before us. And where's our eyes? Where's our focus always? We look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. He despised the shame and now has been sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. All the runners run, but one receives the crown. Are we running so as to be that victor? Not to receive a, a perishable wreath, as it were, but to receive the crown of life. The lesson is yours. If there's anyone here this morning who is in need in some way, needs to put on Christ in baptism, start the process, start running the race that has been set before us, we're ready to assist you in that process. We stand ready to assist those that maybe are struggling in some way or need encouragement. We're ready to, to pray with you, pray for you, whatever the need would be. If you have one this morning, as we stand and sing at this time, please come up to the front. Someday you'll stand at the